Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Myers. I'm the president of the Center for Jewish History. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event. This is the final event in our new series entitled History Matters that debuted in January. Uh, we have had four extremely important and helpful sessions to allow us to understand better the link between past and present, beginning in January uh, with uh, Deborah Lipstadt, then we had Professor Jan Gross, followed by Professor Todd Gitlin, uh, followed by Professor Ruth Weiss, and tonight we are really privileged to have uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna in conversation with Jane Eisner, the Editor-in-Chief of The Forward. The rationale for our series is indeed to bring history and historical perspective into conversation with important and pressing issues of the day. And we've been really delighted to have robust conversations that link the work of first-rate scholars and important and pressing uh, issues that concern us all in today's world. Uh, once again, we turn our attention today to the United States. We have two uh, really outstanding and uh, incisive analysts of Jewish life, past and present, um, and I know it will be uh, a most stimulating program. Um, I'm really most appreciative on this occasion, which is the final, the fifth and final uh, event in our History Matters series this season. Um, I'm really delighted to acknowledge uh, and extend my deep gratitude to Dina and Jonathan Leader, whose inspired generosity allowed for this series to take place. Um, and we had hoped to see the leaders here, but unfortunately, uh, logistics um, intervened and they weren't able to make their way up from Florida, as they've done on a number of other occasions. But John Leader asked that I read a note uh, uh, in his absence. So here goes. Dina and I applaud the Center for Jewish History on its outstanding series, History Matters. We feel that despite the differences among Jews today regarding ritual practice, synagogue attendance, and other matters, the one thing that binds us together is our history. We believe in a symbolic way that all Jews were present at Mount Sinai and that it is the responsibility today of all Jews to help one another. In view of the above, it is our pleasure to renew our gift to the Center of Jewish History for another series of four or five outstanding events on the subject, History Matters. We want to thank the Center for Jewish History staff for its outstanding work in making this series such a success. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge and thank Dina and Jonathan Leader for their support. Thank you very much. Now, this is wonderful news, um, and the good news is that there's more wonderful news, which is that additional uh, giving opportunities exist. Um, in case you thought that this may have resolved all of uh, our issues and there weren't other uh, opportunities, I'm pleased to tell you that there are. Um, we are a cultural nonprofit in the city of New York, uh, and as such, uh, we depend on the friendship and partnership of the general public, uh, of you, uh, in order to survive and in order to guarantee that the study of Jewish history, really one of the most remarkable tales known in recorded history, can be preserved for future generations. This is an extremely important task and all the more important given our commitment to bring history alive and make the lessons of the past relevant to today's world. Um, I will be delighted to talk with any of you who are interested in uh, exploring opportunities to help the center at the reception that will follow uh, this evening's conversation. Um, I want to just say a brief word of, of hello to my friends and colleagues, Jane Eisner and Professor Jonathan Sarna, to extend my congratulations to Professor Sarna on his imminent receipt of an honorary doctorate at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America tomorrow. Thank, congratulations for that. And I'd like to now call upon another dear colleague and friend, Dr. Annie Pollan, the Executive Director of the American Jewish Historical Society to introduce this evening's program. Thank you very much. Good evening. So um, you're here because you think history matters. 
Um, we know that our speakers tonight believe that history matters. Um, I think the larger question is whether people outside of this auditorium necessarily believe that history matters. In other words, is the idea that history matters necessarily widespread? And if it isn't, what is the role of places like this um, to, uh, to wake people up to the importance of history? So this is something we think about at the center, the five partners of the center think about this on a daily basis. Um, and we're so excited tonight to welcome uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna and Jane Eisner to explore this issue anew. Um, before we do, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction and I wanna introduce you not just to the speakers, but to the archives and the stories that this building holds. Um, so one, uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna has written over 30 books, written or edited over 30 books. Um, and it, it's hard for me to say what my favorite book is, but I can say what my favorite article is. And it was an article, so in addition to all the books, <laughs> he's written articles. And um, A Great Awakening, I think, was written in 1990, and I read it a few years later as a graduate student. Um, and it was an article about a cultural renaissance that happens at the late, in the late 19th century. Um, there was a, a fear in the late 19th, late 19th century and a sense of crisis. What will the future of American Jewry be? Um, and so it was a favorite of mine in graduate school, and as I've come here, I realize that many of the things he spoke about in terms of the cultural awakening are actually here. Uh, in the archive. So in brief, a, a brief synopsis of the article is that in the late 19th century there was a sense of crisis and um, when there was a renaissance and many people, it's commonplace today for people to think that that renaissance was this, the East European Jewish immigration, which of course was important and there's no way to look at this picture which is 1898, Orchard Street, and not see vitality, vitality in the burgeoning garment industry, in the stores, in the pushcart market, in the language, in the expression of Yiddish theater, and perhaps most importantly, the Yiddish press. And when this picture was taken, the Jewish Daily Forward, the foreverse, was only a year old. Um, so people on the street have just read this exciting thing, the foreword. And so it's especially exciting tonight that the foreword in a new uh, renaissance is here in the form of, of Jane Eisner. But even before this renaissance happened with regard to migration and, and what the East European Jews would bring to America, Sarna's article, The Great Awakening, talks about East, uh, Central European Jews and American-born Jews who created a whole renaissance, an efflorescence of cultural expressions that we have upstairs. Oops. So these are our archives. They don't look so vital, but inside each and every one of these boxes are stories that are amazing. And I would be happy at any point to give you a tour of this archive and share the wonderful stories that are here. But a, a little bit of a taste is um, one of the organizations that was a part of this cultural awakening was the American Jewish Historical Society, which formed in 1892. And you can see here a picture of Cyrus Adler, who was only 28 years old at the time, who became a secretary of the American Jewish Historical Society. And the founders of the society believed that these stories, if people knew the history, if people knew the story, that would be so important for American Jewish identity going forward. Um, the National Council of Jewish Women is another important um, organization that came about in 1893. This is the first national organization of women and would be very involved both in history, they were subscribers to the American Jewish Historical Society, and they were also very helpful in um, the East European Jews arriving and, and helping them adapt to New York. Um, Ray Littman Frank, or Ray, Ray Frank Littman, the first girl woman rabbi, as she was called, um, awakened uh, people on the West Coast to the importance of Judaism um, in sermons she gave in high holiday services. So, uh, amazing story in and of herself. And perhaps my favorite is Emma Lazarus, that takes us back to that first picture. Emma Lazarus was a Jew of Sephardi descent, born here, lived a block away from here on a brownstone on 14th Street. She was a fourth generation American Jew, but she was awakened to the importance of Jewish identity in part, but not only, but in part as a reaction to the wave of East European Jews arriving. As you know, she would write the New Colossus, the poem that would give the Statue of Liberty new meaning. Um, and I'm one of the proudest, most wonderful things about being in this building is that this book where she wrote the New Colossus 
this is, we're in the same building that it's in right now. Um, so this is just a few things that we're gonna hear about today, thinking about in the late 19th century, what's going on now in the early 21st century? How can we derive hope from the ways that people over a century ago recreated Judaism and Jewish life and cultural expression? Um, so tonight, here with us to look at these issues are Jean Eisner and Professor Jonathan Sarna. Jane Eisner is a pioneer in journalism. She became the editor-in-chief of The Forward in 2008, the first woman to hold the position at the influential Jewish New National News Organization. Under her leadership, The Forward readership has grown significantly and has won numerous regional and national awards for its original journalism in print and online. She is a frequent commentator on radio and television and has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, WNYC, um, and History Matters and other stations around the country and the world. Before joining The Forward, Eisner held executive editorial and news positions at the Philadelphia Inquirer for 25 years. She has deep roots in academe and is currently a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's program on research and religion on urban civil society. Um, her book, Taking Back the Vote, Getting American Youth Involved in Our Democracy, was published by Beacon Press in 2004. She received a master's degree from Columbia University School of Journalism and graduated from Wesleyan University in 1977, where she was the first female editor of the college newspaper and later was a member of the Board of Trustees. There's more that we can say about Jane Eisner, and you can see that in your, in your program. Jonathan Sarna is a university professor and the Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History and Chair of the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership at Brandeis University. He is also the past president of the Association for Jewish Studies and chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. Um, he was dubbed by the Forward newspaper as one of America's 50 most influential American Jews. Um, he was chief historian for the 350th commemoration of the American Jewish community and is recognized as a leading commentator on American Jewish history, religion, and life. Dr. Sarna has written, edited, or co-edited more than 30 books, including Lincoln and the Jews, A History, and When General Grant Expelled the Jews. He is best known for the acclaimed American Judaism, A, His uh, a History, and which was also the winner of the Jewish Book Council's Jewish Book of the Year Award in 2004. That book has been praised as being the single best description of American Judaism during its 350 years on American soil. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests as we explore one history. <laughs> Thank you, David, and thank you, Annie, for such an amazing introduction. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate you coming out on this rainy evening, and I hope that you will find this conversation worthwhile. Um, we're going to talk tonight about all sorts of big themes uh, in American Jewish history, uh, the way that Jonathan Sarna has been able to create a sort of multidisciplinary approach all sorts of questions about lessons for today. But Jonathan, I would like to start by asking you about one of the very first pieces of history you wrote for a driver's education course. So, uh, um, first of all, let me say what a joy it is to be here. And uh, uh, since Annie started us off, uh, a lot of my training came from the American Jewish Historical Society, uh, where I worked in college, and uh, we, uh, my scholarship, and I think American Jewish Historical Scholarship generally, uh, wouldn't exist but for the collections uh, that the AJHS uh, holds. Now, um, uh, I'm, I'm not forgetting the question, but oh, I wouldn't let you. <laughs> they. Um, there's a brand new book uh, edited by uh, Jeffrey Gurak, which really gives um, uh, mini autobiographies of a lot of people in the field. In fact, some of the American Jewish historians here, I see uh, Professor Deborah Dashmore, Professor Pamela Nadell, they have chapters, and I have a chapter too, and I read the whole book. One of the interesting things I discover in this book is that I seem to have been the only person who 
came to American Jewish history in high school. Uh, everybody else, you know, in college and graduate school later on. Uh, but it's actually true, um, maybe because my parents were immigrants and my father was a renowned Jewish scholar and Jewish scholarship was kind of the family business. I had to find my niche. The only area that my dad didn't know anything about was American Jewish history. It was uh, uh, not, not part of his world, so I, I carved that out. But I, um, I think in a more serious way, it was a, uh, enabled me, as I think it should enable American Jews, to figure out their place, both as Americans and as Jews. And I've always felt that in order to understand American Jewish history, one really needed to, one really needs to explore uh, the two contexts that shape the community. And I loved American history in high school and um, uh, in high school, uh, in, as a senior, I was able to do a big paper on uh, and the history of anti-Semitism long before there were any books. And then now we come against that background. I was a senior in high school, that's the age then and now, when in Massachusetts you learn how to drive. And the town fathers in Massachusetts, in their infinite wisdom, had decided it had to be a serious subject. So in addition to whatever else they, what practical value they taught, in driver's education, you had to write a paper. And it had to relate in some way to the automobile or its history. Could you well, ever imagine this happening today? I, I, I don't know whether really anywhere in the kind, I've never <laughs> explored. But in any case, we were quite, this was um, uh, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, the early 70s, actually. And um, we were a rebellious lot. So I wrote on the anti-Semitism of Henry Ford. <laughs> um, and that's about the automobile, yes. Yeah, so I did original research. I had <laughs> footnotes. The driving instructor told me it was the best and most serious paper he had ever received. There was, however, one flaw. And that is, it turns out, knowing the, the history of the anti-Semitism of Henry Ford helps you not at all <laughs> in passing the driving test, <laughs> which I failed. Uh, <laughs> and had to uh, kind of take, I was too busy reading history and didn't spend enough time on the road. Uh, I eventually learned, but, uh, but it did teach me uh, those two experiences, one, the long paper, uh, that I wrote um, in high school as a senior and, and won this short paper that I really uh, enjoyed uh, research and, uh, and writing history. And uh, then I went off to Brandeis. And of course, in those days, the American Jewish Historical Society was on the Brandeis campus. So it was very easy for me uh, to spend a lot of time there and uh, so much time there that they offered me a job. And so uh, I spent um, uh, a few years really um, uh, working in archives, some of those, arch those boxes. Uh, I pasted and organized and uh, did all the things and, and, and there, there are some important collections. I, I sometimes astonish students by saying, you know, if you look in a certain collection, little do they know that I was the archivist way back when uh, who put it together and learned a great deal uh, there. So and, um, um, I, yeah. I, I, I want to uh, stop you there because one of the things that I found so interesting in reading about your evolution as a historian. So, so you decide that you want to really seriously study American Jewish history. And you said that you were worried about two things. Were you going to get a job? Right. And I think that's probably something that people would still care about today. But the second thing I thought was so interesting, you didn't know how to train. Right. Because was this Jewish history? Was it American history? Right. Or was it part of this 
fledgling American religious history that was beginning to be a discipline. Right. So, so take us yeah. back to that time, and, and how did you reconcile that? So, you know, the question really was, well, okay, you're going to be an American Jewish historian. How do you study that, and where do you go? Um, and as I said, it was clear to me that um, one needed to know Jewish history. Well, I'd been studying that for quite some time at, at Brandeis and before, and it was clear to me that one needed American history. And then S Sidney Alstrom had at that time just published his huge book, A Religious History of the American People, was deeply influential. And it was clear that suddenly there was a new religious history, and it was clear to me that if one wanted to understand American Judaism, one needed to understand it within that context. So I actually looked around, and uh, it was harder to do before the computer, but there were, there were four universities that had American history, that many had, also, Jewish history, and also had a specialist in American religion. And I ended up going to Yale, because that's where Sidney Alstrom was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was actually um, very interested in having a student in American Judaism. And it had the finest American history program in the country at that time. Uh, so that's where I ended up going. but there really wasn't a way to train in American Jewish history. Today, there are a few centers, I'm glad to say. I think Brandeis is one of them, where we train people in American Jewish history. But I think even if we look here, it, was, it wasn't that way uh, at, that, at that time. And, uh, and the field's And you grown. describe yourself as being, you think, the first person to ever enter the uh, sacred portals of Yale's Hall of Graduate Studies with a yarmulke on your head. Is that true? Um, I think I go on and say, and, and the desire to study American Jewish history in his heart, <laughs> and that's certainly true. I am the first <laughs> PhD in, um, on a subject in American Jewish history from, uh, from Yale, and you know, later Beth Wenger and others, um, uh, uh, did it, but they had not had anyone before. Kingman Brewster was the president of um, Yale at that time, a great figure um, in many ways in terms of uh, knocking down the barriers that, against Jews at Yale and bringing also African Americans to Yale. Skip Gates uh, credits uh, Brewster as well. And so he, he loved ceremony. That's why later they made him ambassador to the court of St. James. But um, uh, he would line all the graduate students up, everybody in caps and gowns, and everybody marches in. And they had two graduate students, allow me to present you, Mr. President. And they would name the names. And then he came to me. And I had this yarmulke on my head. And he asks me what I want to do. And I say to him, I'm interested in studying American Jewish history. Well, in all his years as president at Yale, nobody had ever come up and said that to him. And to his great credit, he was very interested. And it seemed to me I'd really made a hit. He, he stops the, the proceedings. He, uh, he introduces me to his wife. He shows me through uh, his home, takes me out to the patio, escorts me where there's going to be this reception, but then he spoiled it all. He looks at me, he says, Mr. Sarna, do you think you might be able to use your special connections with the divine to ensure that it doesn't rain on our little party? <laughs> and I realized that actually didn't quite understand us as well as I hoped, <laughs> uh, but his intentions were great. And, uh, and I have to say, I thought I got a fabulous education there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've always been you know, grateful to Yale for what really must have been a kind of act of affirmative action um, uh, at there. We've never had someone in this field, uh, you know, who knows, maybe uh, uh, this will be exciting, yeah. So you um, graduated in 
graduated from Yale, you went to Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati where you spent many wonderful years and met your wife there, and then went to Brandeis in 1990, right. uh, and that's where you've been right. ever it, since. It should with, be underscored yes. that actually when I graduated in 1979, I didn't have a job, and a lot of my cohort didn't. <laughs> I think some students today think where it's, again, terribly difficult, that, oh, it was so easy for the previous generation and so hard for them, uh, but actually in 1979, America was in deep economic trouble and my entire cohort um, uh, had trouble and I was very lucky, Jacob Rader Marcus at the American Jewish Archives, whom I had met, the man who more or less founded the field of American Jewish history, uh, he uh, really put together what the first postdoc, uh, I, I mean, they didn't use the term, but I was essentially a post, had a postdoc in Cincinnati, and they, I guess they, they, found, they called me a fellow, and I guess they found me a good fellow, because then I stayed around and uh, uh, was really uh, there for, um, uh, for a decade, which I want to say, um, not only because I met my wife there, but also because I learned Reform Judaism at its source. Mm -hmm. And having grown up in a very different world, studied at an Orthodox yeshiva and uh, I grew up at the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, uh, so I know all of the three movements from the inside, mm -hmm. um, which has been immensely valuable uh, for me. Uh, in understanding American Judaism. Of course, if God turns out to be a reconstructionist, <laughs> which would be a very great uh, irony, uh, then I'll be in trouble. <laughs> but right. otherwise, I know them, uh, I know them from the inside, yeah. So your seminal work at, at that point in your life was the book about American Judaism. And you tell of a, um, a, a dispute about the title yeah. and what that taught you. So maybe you could share sure. that. Uh, titles are important. I wanted to call the book Ever Dying People because the theme, which came out of uh, Rabidovich, of course, a very influential essay, and my teacher Marshall Sclair had, had once uh, shown how that applied to America, and here I was writing a history that showed Every generation of American Jews worries that it will be the last generation, and that goes back oh, to the 17th century. That is the theme in American Jewish history, and each generation works very, very hard to try and make sure that um, uh, its prophecy uh, will, be a ne will not happen. Yes, as, as Jonathan Sachs points out, the difference between a prediction and a prophecy if a prediction comes true, you have succeeded. If a prophecy comes true, the prophet has failed. So um, uh, the, the goal, and, and so I wanted to call it Ever Dying People. And the folks at Yale said, nobody will buy a book called Ever Dying People. Um, and uh, uh, that taught me that uh, uh, you have to be very careful when you title uh, your your books, and we must have gone through 20 other titles. I have a list somewhere. And then Lara Heimert, who was my brilliant editor at Yale, um, said, you know what, we're going to call it American Judaism a History. That's what it is, and uh, that will tell people, you know, wh why this book is important. And that, of course, was the correct title. And it taught me a very uh, uh, significant uh, uh, lesson about, about titles. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to pass it along. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And you also tell of this fascinating story about learning of the um, collection of, of um, information about Lincoln and the Jews. And I had the um, I had the privilege of seeing the exhibit at um, at the uh, New York Historical Society, and I, and the wonderful book that you wrote from that. But I was really interested to learn 
how, you ca how that came about. So you were giving a talk about Jews in the Civil War and right. pick it up from there. Okay, <laughs> so I, I, I actually, the, the, the question is about my, my book with Benjamin Chappelle uh, called Lincoln and the Jews and you, you notice how I learned from one title about another <laughs> title. No, uh, they, they wanted all sorts of cutesy titles. It's about Lincoln and the Jews, a history. But anyway, um, how did that book come about? I never thought of writing about Lincoln. Uh, I had done a book uh, uh, just before then called When General Grant Expelled the Jews about Grant's Order Number 11. Um, and that was based on the fact it was the anniversary of the Civil War, but it was also based on the fact that when I wrote that little section in American Judaism, I kind of made a mental note that, gee, this hasn't really been studied, and somehow or other, <coughs> um, uh, this chapter really deserves to be better known, and Excuse me, and then I, I noticed that books about Grant didn't pay much attention to that chapter and its aftermath, and I made an, and, and, and so I, I, when the opportunity came um, and Jonathan Rosen came to me for a book, I, I said, sure, we'll do that. And, um, and then I thought I was done with the Civil War. And then I was giving talks, I gave it right, uh, no, not, not, not here at the, I gave a talk here at the center, but this was somewhere else in New York. I gave a talk on Grant and the Jews, and after the talk, a man comes up to me and says, I must talk to you. I say, I'd love to talk to you, but I got a shuttle to catch, and uh, uh, you know, I, I must catch that shuttle. And he said, oh, no problem. Uh, I'll fly up to Brandeis, and we'll talk there. So. Okay, I knew something about it, uh, and he set a time, and um, uh, and he came, uh, and it turned out to be uh, Benjamin Chappelle, and uh, it was amazing. He um, told me about his collection, and it was instantly clear to me that this man has the finest private collection of Lincolniana dealing with Jews in private hand, and that stuff he described to me, nobody knew about. And, um, you know, we have to do a book. So, you know, you're a story, you want to bring it to the public. He had wanted to do a book, um, and, you know, he read mine, he said, you know the context, and you know how to write books, I know how to collect, you know how to write books. And um, uh, I more or less agreed, probably foolishly, on the spot to, uh, that we would do that, but then it became clear, if you're gonna do a book on Lincoln, you've gotta do it very quickly because it's gonna be the, the 150th um, anniversary of the assassination and books have to be timely. Um, and uh, you know we needed to bring it out in 2015 and there were a great many Lincoln books in 2015 for the 150th anniversary uh, of the assassination, uh, and that's what we did. Um, it was a great deal, I have to say, uh, of work, because I had to teach myself that uh, subject. Uh, uh, ben has a, really knows an enormous amount about Lincoln and had some staff working with him, um, uh, and uh, it probably was too much, because uh, at the very end of that process, as uh, some people here know, uh, I, I collapsed, but um, uh, uh, and, 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 and I read the galleys for the book in the hospital, but, um, uh, but it was worth it, and I will say that, for, for, I'm allowed to advertise it, but because Ben was responsible, he made a beautiful book. It was text and these amazing um, documents, and um, uh, you know, then we were able to mount an exhibit uh, which uh, was one of the best attended exhibits at the New York Historical Society. And uh, they told me, uh, it was advertised in the New York Times and the other article about, a lot of Hasidim came. They had never 
in the whole history of the New York Historical Society <laughs> seen Hasidim there. And, um, you know, for Lincoln and for what it was described, and it was Pesach. And so they all on Cholamoid Pesach came streaming uh, uh, there. Uh, but in a serious way, I think that we taught American Jews that their history, first of all, it extends much further than they realized. And second of all, that it's not apart from American history. Lincoln isn't just somebody else's history. There are elements of Lincoln, and argued in the book, um, uh, that, that, that Lincoln plays a role of making Jews insiders. He has a lot of um, uh, Jewish advisors. Uh, he's interested in Jews and, and of course, um, is responsible for Jewish chaplains, and there are wonderful documents here at the Society on uh, that whole chapter. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think it was uh, very important in terms of teaching American Jews about their own history, which has always been important to me. History matters, that's what this is called, and I couldn't agree more. And of course, our timing was actually very good because with, I certainly don't want to get into politics, but when you read about Lincoln, let's just say there were significant contrasts between <laughs> Abraham Lincoln and uh, the present occupant of his seat in the White House. And I think that bringing home some of that, there are whole quotes um, of Lincoln where um, he rails against prejudice and um, uh, Lincoln's private letter, that's by the way what I found so amazing about working on Lincoln, the private Lincoln, the Lincoln you read in his private letters is the same, it's just as good as the public Lincoln. That's not true of everybody in the archives, <laughs> Not even true of every president. Yeah, the private Richard Nixon uh, is different than the public Richard Nixon, famously. But Lincoln it is. And Lincoln on the know-nothings, for example, and his attack on the know-nothings, I have read that, and it could be a commentary on our time. Um, and, and I think, in a sense, looking back at Lincoln, um, uh, does inform the present moment in significant ways. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I noticed as you recounted uh, the books that you wrote and the reception that they got, um, that these later books, the book about Grant and the book about Lincoln, seem to get noticed in the broader world. Mm -hmm. New York Times Book Review, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you see a message in that. Does that, does that speak of a broader acceptance of an interest in American Jewish history? I do think that in my lifetime, American Jewish history um, has broken into the mainstream. The very fact that Harvard University Press, Yale University Press, and Princeton University Press all now regularly mm -hmm. publish in American Jewish history is deeply significant. Uh, Moses, Rishon, and I started a series at Wayne State University Press because no one would publish American Jewish history and we thought we could publish the best work in the field. Now, Wayne State was a wonderful press, but it's not a first or even a second tier press, but still that was where we thought we went. And today, uh, it's totally different. The best books in the field that you invariably have reviewed in the foreword are, are published by the best presses. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think there were individual books earlier that one can point to, but they were very rare. Moses Rishon's book 
was published by Harvard, and it took maybe 20 years uh, before Harvard published uh, another volume. So I do think that it's much more accepted. It's also the case that a lot more people care about Ulysses S. Grant and Abraham Lincoln than about the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, and so uh, my books on Lincoln and Grant got a lot more attention, even though I, I actually spent a long time and learned a great deal about the Jewish Publication Society. And uh, I keep being persuaded that one day that will be rediscovered. There's good stuff I, I, there. I, I think but Oprah not will put it as one of her books for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so um, you. You mentioned that you are going to be reprising American Judaism. So yeah. what's it going to say? Um, I'm bringing out a second edition of American Judaism. Uh, first of all, it's amazing how much the world has changed since I submitted the manuscript at the very um, uh, in the middle of 2003. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, much of it was planned in 2002. So we're really talking about uh, 60, 15 years, you know, that have passed. I mean, to give an obvious example, I have a big section on uh, the, m the movement of, of gay rights and gay, lesbian, and so on, which gets a tiny mention in the first edition. That is the fastest, um, uh, 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 the speediest social movement in American history from when it first gets onto the public's consciousness until gay marriage uh, and, and, and gay rabbis and the transformation of synagogues. Like any, my definition of an important movement in Judaism is one that actually traverses all of the movements, so orthodoxy, conservative reform, all have grappled with that issue. Um, and I wrote a long um, section on that. Obviously, the much discussed Pew study uh, required discussion. Uh, the conservative movement in 2018 is in a very different place than the conservative movement was uh, when I wrote the first edition. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, um, it will not shock anybody here to learn that the uh, conservative movement has fallen. Um, and the question is why, and here's where my methodology differs. Most of the work on the conservative movement talks about mistakes conservative movement made, internal issues. But when you study American religion, you view it altogether differently. First of all, you realize that all middle range religious movements in America, uh, the, the Protestant mainstream, mainline Protestantism, which was centrist Protestantism, has also collapsed. And almost at the same number, percentage wise, as the conservative movement. And then of course you say, Look at the culture. The culture has polarized. The middle has fallen out of American politics and of American culture. So it's no great surprise that a religious movement that really espoused the middle is in trouble. Um, uh, the conservative movement really flourished at a moment when Americans thought that the center was where to be. Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote a big book, The Vital Center. And, uh, and many of us, uh, I look around, uh, we, we studied the consensus. And you read about that. That's what made America special. And so on in the, the 60s. Well, and if that's the case, the concern <coughs> conservative movement seem to be the place to be. Uh, obviously, there are all sorts of special factors uh, in how it uh, uh, responded to suburbia and so on. But um, 
uh, the collapse of the center in the American context is to my mind as important for understanding the decline of the conservative movement as internal factors. And when I said at the beginning, you have to know American history and American religion in addition to just American Jewish history, there's an example of looking comparatively and saying this is a bigger and more complicated story than just the story that's told um, uh, now. And it's also a corollary because it suggests that one day, Ameri when the center is recovered in America, if you look in America, there are periods of polarization and then periods when people say, oh my God, we've had a civil war or we may almost have a civil war. Let's get people together. When the center recovers, I think centrist Judaism will also recover. I don't know if that center will be centered uh, in the conservative movement as we once knew it, but I do think that um, uh, there is a relationship between the rise of centrist Judaism and the importance of the center in American life as a whole. Uh, I want to turn our attention um, towards Israel for a moment. Um, you've made a point uh, at different times in your career of making sure that your work is translated into Hebrew mm -hmm. because you believe that Israelis don't know enough about American Jews and in particular American Judaism. Right. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your rationale and, and how that relates to the growing divide that we are experiencing today. No, it's a wonderful uh, question and indeed um, as some of you know, I'm going to be uh, directing a big center for Israel studies at Brandeis, the Schusterman Center, and one of the areas I want to explore is indeed um, the relationship between America, American Jews, and Israel. There are today two great centers of the Jewish people, North America and Israel. That's about 85% of world Jewry. Now, American Jews have actually learned a lot about Israel. There is an association of Israel studies, has about 300 members. Uh, and most fine universities have professors of Israel studies. When I go to Israel and I bring together all the experts on America and American Jewry, I, with difficulty, get a minion, an egalitarian minion. Um, and there's something wrong with, the f with that. And we pay a huge price for the fact that all that Israelis learn about American Jewry is two themes. They, they learn about assimilation and they learn about anti-Semitism. That's what's reported. I have on five different occasions, spent a year in Israel, and the news is about American Jewry are those two themes. Last time I was in Israel, there was a television program uh, dedicated to the fact that American Jew and Elamim are disappearing. And, uh, you know, it, it interviewed various people uh, whose children intermarried and disappeared. Um, there is a huge problem, um, uh, it seems to me, from the fact that Israelis know so little about American Jewry. I'll give you another example from my year just last year. Uh, after the election of Donald Trump, um, uh, so not uh, 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 the prime minister, but the leader of the opposition, who actually once had studied in America, says that Israel should be prepared for waves of immigrants from the United States and the Jewish agency should immediately make plans. I, I wondered you know, which uh, 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 refugee uh, 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 places they were gonna set aside for the Americans. Now, that you could say something 
and people took it seriously and discussed it, seemed to me another illustration of this enormous chasm. Uh, and the fact that really leading universities in Israel are weak on American Jewry um, just underscores that problem. So um, I at least have worked hard to get uh, I've three books translated into Hebrew. And um, incidentally, we, when the Lincoln and the Jews was translated into Hebrew, and it, it was fascinating to me. I mean, first of all, uh, the, the, the big news when that book came out for the Israelis was that we insisted that his name was Lincoln and not Lincoln, as they <laughs> pronounce it. And this, uh, this made a lot, got a lot of attention. But um, at the opening, there were several Chavre Knesset, members of the parliament, who told me, we never learned about the Civil War. We're so glad there's a book in Hebrew. I knew there was a street named for Lincoln, but honestly, we didn't know anything about him. And um, it, it underscores uh, what a bad job we have done in teaching Israelis about American Jewry. Uh, and I think we pay a huge price uh, uh, for the ignorance that Israelis have. And um, I, I would say further that I, I, I think um, there are many in Israel who currently believe that actually the non-Orthodox community will disappear well, in the, 30, 40 the years. The Prime Minister has said that. Exactly. And that's, I mean, he saw that film, and that's what his advisors tell him, and that's, you know, some of their reading. And policy is made on the basis mm -hmm. of that idea. And, you know, it couldn't be more ignorant. Uh, really, and reflects an enormous chasm uh, between uh, the way the American Jewish community understands itself and the way Israel views it. And, um, uh, you know, my sense is that we have a lot of work to do. But the good news is lots of Israelis now come to America. And unfortunately, when they come of their own volition, we don't teach them much about America and American Jewry. I wonder how many of them come to visit the Center for Jewish History, the American Jewish Historical Society, the National Museum of American Jewish History. Uh, they don't. Uh, they go, their travel uh, tour guides take them to, you know, normal places without any connection to American, American Jewry. And I think uh, we need to essentially think about a reverse birthright. Um, where uh, we, we would train Israelis who are here. We bring these Israelis to your children's summer camps uh, and to uh, thousands of them, but we don't teach them anything about America and American Jewry. And so I think that is <clears throat> really very important uh, for our, our, our future agenda. I, I just want to pick up on that a little bit because I'm wondering if you had the chance to pick t three or four major themes that you think Israelis ought to know about the current state of American Jews and American Judaism, what would you want them to know? So the first thing is that Israelis see a high intermarriage rate. Yes, they're told the non-Orthodox Jews. True, 70% intermarriage, and that explains why they think American Jewry will soon disappear. But one of the great differences is that American Jews are now much more interested in how are the children being raised. And, you know, when you take Israelis, I've done it, uh, you take, we have a reformed Jewish day school, Rashi school in Boston. There's a huge reformed day school in Los Angeles, Stephen S. Wise. And here are these kids studying in a Jewish school. And then you say, oh, by the way, they, you know, 
they're the products of intermarriage. One parent in each case wasn't born Jewish, may not be Jewish, certainly not from the perspective of the chief rabbi, maybe both of them aren't Jews from the perspective of the chief <laughs> rabbi. And yet, look what they're studying. And that complicates it. Um, and at least you need to know that there are plenty, not enough, but there are plenty of children of intermarriage who are being brought up as Jews. And of course, that explains why uh, some of the issues about whether you're going to accept converts is so crucial. Um, and then I would like them to meet some of the women rabbis in America and go to some of those congregations. And then maybe you'd understand why the Kotel issue is so important to American Jews. At the same time, American Jews need to understand, which they don't. Most Israelis say the Kotel? That's a place Haredim go. I met Israelis who hadn't been to the Kotel since they were inducted into the army and went there. They were amazed that American Jews care about the Kotel. To their perspective, the Kotel is uh, a suburb of Mea Sharim um, uh, and, and so on. And these are the issues that need to be illuminated so that these two communities better understand one another. Um, uh, so those would be at least two things uh, that I would want, um, uh, you know, Israelis to understand. I find that far too many Israelis, and this will be very controversial here, far too many Israelis imagine that American Jewry and New York Jewry are synonyms. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say it here, but they're not. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, um, and, of course, Jewish but, but life is... But the reverse is, is true, because really all New Yorkers are Jews. At least right. that's what, right. we, that's what yeah. we think. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but <laughs> uh, you need, one needs to under, they need to understand some of those differences. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, but uh, anyone uh, uh, who's taught in Israel is astonished by um, how little some Israelis know. And, you know, like in all education, when you make assumptions, oh, they must know this, those assumptions turn out not to be uh, correct. It's enormously important uh, at the same time for Israelis to understand that actually the first Aliyah, the second Aliyah that they're so proud of, those are the same Jews from Eastern Europe who came here, whose work is chronicled in the, the archives of the Yivo and the American Jewish Historical Site. And sometimes it was an accident. Did you go here? Did you go there? Were you, Amolam and Bilu, they were the same people. Um, and it's enormously important uh, that that be better understood and that those links uh, and ties be, um, uh, be better understood historically. And finally, and uh, Israelis have no appreciation for the fact that the crucial element, really, in many respects, in immigration, we always say, well, the Holocaust was certainly was important, but it was 1924. Once immigration to America is cut off, where else are these East European Jews <laughs> gonna go? They go to, not all of them, but they go to Israel and Palestine, and the very first year where you can see that the numbers going to the land of Israel from, East, from Russia exceeds the numbers coming to America is 1925. That is not an accident. Um, and that's important because it shows that it's not just the Holocaust. It's that we here in America were not prepared to be the homeland, the refuge, for all persecuted Jews. Louis Brandeis understood that very well. That's why he became interested in Zion. He knew uh, and could see 
that America was going to cut off immigration, and he felt there needed to be a place where all Jews could go. And understanding that, and then of course today, having seen what, where Syrians were turned away, we ought to understand it better. Understanding that helps us understand even the interaction between the history of the Yeshuv, of pre-state Palestine, and the history of the Jews in the United States. Uh, that link between coming to America and going to, to, to the land of Israel is an enormously important one. And the whole role of America in modern Jewish history is, seems to me to be a subject uh, that needs um, much more attention uh, by historians uh, of the modern era. Well, yeah. thank you. In just a moment, we're going to turn to your questions. But if I may uh, take the prerogative of the moderator just to get personal for a moment. You, you've had in your life two pretty serious um, challenges with your health. You had uh, cancer, and then more recently you alluded to the fact that you had this you know, sudden and quite serious cardiac arrest. And in, in bo after both uh, of these incidents in your essay, you talk about how it affected your work and your, your desire to get certain things done. And I wonder if you can share that with us. Uh, I mean, it is, of course, true uh, that they are. I mean, your paper more or less printed my obituary that uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm one of the people like my, who read it, but um, um, uh, they, uh, and, and with good reason. I mean, uh, um, uh, they actually asked my wife whether uh, uh, all means should be used or, you know, just let him go. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, uh, she, she said, well, you know, do whatever you can. Um, and it worked out well. But um, I would certainly after, my, my single greatest regret, cancer is a much longer event, meaning uh, cardiac arrest happens and it's terrible for those around you, traumatized my family, but I don't remember it. But cancer is a long event. And um, I would say my single greatest regret uh, um, uh, uh, in, in 1999, when I had cancer at the age of 44, it's not but you cancer, one in five chance of making it, um, my single greatest regret was that I had not finished American Judaism. And uh, that's what I felt I really, that was going to be my book and why didn't I work faster and so on. And of course, as anyone who's had cancer knows, you make deals. If I survive, I'm not going to do anything else but work on that book. In my case, I took it seriously, and, and I actually um, did work on nothing else. And um, I'm not sure the book would have come out when it did, because it's always easy. American Judy is always more to learn and more to write, and it's changing every day. Uh, so, uh, you know, put it off. So I'm not sure it would have come out um, uh, otherwise. I think when you have um, uh, cardiac arrest, you know, in your late 50s, that's a sort of reminder of your mortality. Um, I, I, I suddenly have discovered, I, I've done several essays, um, uh, 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 you know, and I guess this event too about my past, I, I tell myself I'm clearly in my anecdotage, as they call it. I do one mem a, mem a memoir and another. Um, but uh, I would like to imagine that I survived for a reason and do still feel driven uh, to do new scholarship and to you know, train students and do things, because otherwise, what was the point? Um, so in that respect, I think people who have had serious medical crises uh, may be driven in uh, thinking of their mortality in a way uh, that others have not. But in terms of, of cancer, I have a kind of you know, a side job of talking 
to people uh, who have been told to have esophageal cancer and um, living evidence. There is a lot of life uh, after cancer. And I, I do strongly believe none of us will be remembered for the ailments and illnesses we have. We remembered for what we did in spite of the ailments and illnesses. And I'd like to think that's true of me too. Oh, well, that's beautiful, thank you. Um, <laughs> we'd like to uh, open the floor now to your questions. Uh, please do try to make them questions and not statements. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I can make a very brief comment, then a question. Um, uh, uh, Toynbee didn't like the Jews because it, it contradicted his theory that you know cultures live and die, and the Jews, what are they still doing around? I would propose the reason the Israelis pay no attention to American history is it contradicts their idea that all Jews should come to Israel. Why is there this large body of Jews that haven't come yet? So they just ignore. America as not fitting into their, you know, framework of how things should be. And yeah, and, and my question is, I happen to agree with Netanyahu. I think that uh, 30, 40 years from now, I won't see it, uh, at 60, 70, 80% of the Jews left will be Orthodox. Why do you think that's not true? Okay, um, so I agree with the first more than the second. Um, <laughs> I do agree with you that Zionist theory couldn't deal with America. That's why Professor Vital ignores America. He writes three volumes of two volumes of the history of Zionism. Now, and, and he can't deal with America. I spoke to him once. To his mind, America doesn't have any Zionism. Um, and and I do agree with you that. Um, in some respects, America doesn't fit well into classic Zionist thought, and Zionist thinking in America is totally different uh, than elsewhere. Now, uh, in terms of your question, the most dangerous thing for an American Jewish religious movement is to imagine that the future belongs to it. Isaac Mayer Wise, believed all Jews would be reformed. That's why he called his prayer book Minhag America, the custom of American Jews. He didn't call it Minhag Reform. He was persuaded, and the numbers seem to back him up, that uh, Jews would, look at the 1870s, would become reformed. Solomon Schechter and then the conservative movement was absolutely persuaded, uh, and indeed in my memory it was frequently touted uh, that conservative Judaism would be the Judaism of America. It's the United Synagogue. Um, after all, uh, the reform we're going to assimilate out of existence, and the Orthodox uh, we're going to uh, Americanize and move <clears throat> into conservative Judaism. We just got through noting how wrong that was. Uh, Orthodox triumphalism. Uh, I think is uh, really likewise not going to happen. Anyone who knows anything, as you clearly do, about orthodoxy knows how internally divided Israel uh, uh, orthodoxy is. Uh, orthodoxy has a special problem that many of its most important leaders are in Israel, and even if they're not in Israel, they feel that they, they have to listen uh, to rabbis in Israel and heed them, and that's a huge problem because American religious movements that depend on someone outside of America have not fared so well, even the Catholic Church, and um, uh, and, and and you know, and I think that when Jewish religious movements get smug and they imagine, ah, oh, future is ours, that's the first sign of their decline. There are very exciting things going on in American Judaism, some of them in orthodoxy, some of them not in orthodoxy, um, a, a lot of them in New York. These are the seeds of tomorrow's 
great American Jewish awakening. Um, uh, we don't see them now, except those people who pay careful attention, but in 20, 30 years, uh, that will be what's very uh, exciting, I think. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I'm glad you worry. It's good for Jews to worry. Um, uh, that's what's kept us going, but I hope yours is a prophecy, meaning that it won't come true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening. Um, knowing the influence of technology in our society today, I'm just wondering, from the time you wrote that driver's ed paper to uh, the new edition of American Judaism, have your methods of research changed, and if so, how? First of all, pretty soon no one will need drivers. That all the cars will be self-driving. <laughs> there won't any more be people killed and, and injured in the thousands. Will be a good thing. And drivers' ed is not something you want to invest in long term. <laughs> Second of all, yes, totally. Um, uh, much more, I think, than previous generations. First, I mean, I typed. I'm probably the last generation that typed my dissertation. And when I, then I, I got my first job and I saved up and I bought a new word processor. It used this WordStar. I learned by heart all of the commands of WordStar. And I was the first member of the faculty at the Hebrew Union College to have a word processor. And they all came to look at, at this um, machine. And I remember Jacob Petachowski. I'm still going to write with my fountain pen. Um, but, uh, and, and, uh, but in any case, it's not only the writing that has been transformed. Uh, research is transformed. Uh, the amount of material on the web, both the Grant and the Lincoln, they don't let you use Lincoln's original papers, all sorts of people want to say they touched a letter of Lincoln, and thousands and thousands, of course, it'll disintegrate. So you have to use the online Lincoln papers. That was good. I could blow it up if it was hard to read. I could print it out and scribble on it. And um, I could search them in new ways. Um, I, I and every historian I know uh, makes enormous use of the internet. But I'll tell you another thing that we haven't paid attention to. There's great democratization. It used to be, if you wanted to do history with primary sources and use rare books, you needed to be connected with one of those great libraries that lets you touch the primary sources and the rare books, New Yorkers, <laughs> We're lucky the New York Public Library made that possible. Uh, most of places, it was impossible. And there is a reason why so many works of history were written by people at the great universities. It's because the people at the secondary universities didn't have access. Today, it's all changed. So many rare books are available online. Um, I don't, I live in Massachusetts, I go to Harvard rarely, because so many of the books the Hathi Trust has made available. Um, and similarly, uh, more and more archives. A uh, hundred years from now, um, the work of the American Jewish Historical Society and all others will be different because more and more of the archives will be scanned. Um, and people will still need archivists, and we'll still need a historical society, but um, uh, it, it seems to me that digitization has changed everything, and of course, there are many new ways of doing history. Uh, the most exciting elements uh, are digital humanities. You know, look at the number of books that say some, many, a few, that was some historian's guess. Now you can put in all sorts of cases into the computer and you can get 
pretty exact numbers. And sometimes that changes uh, and you discover uh, that what the historian imagined wasn't the case when you actually look at all the court cases and uh, that have been digitized and then, then you know, tr tr try and figure out the percentages. So I would say I have had to relearn a lot. Uh, I learn a lot from my students who frankly are better than I am at finding things often uh, on the web. Um, and uh, I found that very exciting uh, uh, and uh, feel that there's a lot of research that I've done that would have been impossible uh, 20, 30 years ago. Thank you. Well, thank you. Great question. Mm. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sarna, I was wondering if you would just give us a comment on the opening of the American Embassy in Jerusalem um, on the eve on the relationship of that to the evangelicals and to the two evangelical um, clergy who uh, gave sermons. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not going to move into politics, but is it a historic event? Absolutely. Um, and uh, and you know, I hope you mean that that the American Jewish Historical Society is uh, uh, is collecting, because. Uh, 50, 100 years from now, we will look at that as a historic moment. And I'm so very happy that you understood that it's actually all about evangelicals and um, not about American Jews. Um, uh, and that too, I think, is, is, part, of this, um, uh, is part of this history. Um, and uh, you know, there are a lot of events, yes? I do want to remind people, when Harry Truman recognized the state of Israel, the same newspapers that criticize making Jerusalem the capital, many of them, certainly the New York Times, and certainly the State Department, were deeply critical of the recognition of Israel. Whether those two events will be seen the same way, that's for future historians to determine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, um, in a sense, confirm you and I were grad students at the same time. In fact, we met when we were grad students. Um, and uh, okay. yeah. Remind <laughs> me, you looked a little different back then. Uh, you looked a little different, too. Mm. <laughs> um, but Can you remind me your name? What? Can you remind me your name? Jeff Marker. OK, yeah, yeah. OK. So. Um, yeah. Nice anyway, I just wanted to say that, you know, the way you described it, the same people would ask me, what are you studying? I say, well, I study American history and I study Jewish history and my research is American Jewish history. And then, uh, but I listened to the people who said, don't do a PhD in history because there's no jobs there. So I, after my master's, then I ended up going to rabbinical school. But that was my, that was my experience, the same thing. You know, there was no field of American Jewish history at the time. Yeah, well, I, I was very young, as you remember, and I worked very fast. And I said, well, if there are no jobs, I can still go to law school and be done by the time I'm 30. Uh, so things worked out very well. Um, but uh, I don't underestimate how difficult it is again today um, uh, uh, for folks in the field. And you know, I am glad that we have programs like History Matters that remind not only the people here, but especially young people, that history does matter, and having a sense of history is important, even if you plan to make your life uh, working uh, in high tech. That, too, has a history. Uh, so I'm very glad, uh, thank, you, and thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, before we uh, take the opportunity to thank once again our uh, really uh, wonderful panelists, I want to offer two program notes. Um, many nights of the week, there are programs of this quality at the Center for Jewish History uh, and uh, its partner organizations uh, uh, as co-sponsors. 
Um, tomorrow night, um, we will have one of those events. Um, as we continue our first person series, uh, Joe Berger, who used to write for the New York Times, uh, will be doing a program uh, entitled Searching for Jewish Heritage, and he'll be in conversation with Jonathan Ornstein, the executive director of the JCC in, in Krakow, and Halise Lieberman, director of the Toby Center for the Renewal of Jewish Life in Poland. That's here uh, at 6.30 p.m. Um, at the end of uh, tonight's program, in just a minute, we have a reception at which we can continue the conversation. And uh, now it is my uh, pleasure to thank Jane Eisner and Jonathan Sarna for a most stimulating evening. Thank you very much.